program as a response to the violence in Sandy Hook. Uh, people realizing that there is, well, we're in a peace and justice organization, and there is a call for us to be peacemakers here in our own communities. So uh, the, the picture in front of you is a rally just a couple days, at, a couple months after Sandy Hook, saying that in the 133 days since Sandy Hook, there were 152 gun deaths in Michigan alone. Calling to say, we need a different approach to safety in our communities. We can do better. We took that message not just in the streets of Ann Arbor, we took it to the streets of Lansing, brought it back to the streets of Ann Arbor in the anniversary, a cold, cold anniversary of the Sandy Hook anniversary. Um, and now, I don't have a picture of it, because, partly because it's not a very photogenic event, but we've been, we just had a train the trainers experience to help equip <coughs> some of our task force members to be leaders in having these conversations about how do we change the conversation about gun violence, to go into congregations, to go into community groups, and start from the bottom up. When we started this effort, we thought there was a window of opportunity. We'd be able to get some real a legislative change in a short period of time. That window's closed. Now we realize that if we want to change, it's going to be a long haul to push back against the gun lobby. And so we're building up the, the strength and the infrastructure to do that from the ground up. Um, that's some of the domestic peacemaking we're doing. Our Latin America Task Force continues their faithful work on international peacemaking, especially as it relates to our policies to our neighbors to the south, doing education about how US military and economic policy affects the world, bringing that about how it affects people's lives across the world. Uh, right in November, we brought a delegation down to the School of the Americas Watch Vigil at Fort Benning, Georgia. And right now, um, some people use that as a cliche, but it's actually true. Right now, we have people down in Washington, D.C. for a lobby days, a lobby session on that issue. Violence can come from the end of a gun, but an empty bowl, an empty belly, can also be a form of violence. And so our hunger task force continues their work to address that issue. We used to sell a bumper sticker that said, peace begins with the hungry are fed. One way we do that, much of our best work is partnership. It's not just us working alone, it's building coalition, building partnerships with others in the community. One example of that is the Faith of Food Garden Project. It's a collaboration between Interfaith Council for Peace and Justice, Food Gatherers, Growing Hope, and, uh, and 34 area congregations. Last year, those 34 congregations put in little gardens. This is one over at Venus Church, uh, Ann Arbor Christian Reformed Church. I'll put a picture of that. Keep that picture up there because it's this nice, sunny, summer kind of thing. Yeah. <laughs> Today was good, but we need more of that. Yeah. These gardens brought in over 11 tons of food to food gatherers last year. 11 tons. Hunger event is our crop hunger walk every fall where we bring together over 400 people from across the community to raise tens of thousands of dollars for hunger relief here in Washington County and around the world. So that's, that program continues strong, continues vibrant. Um, one of both, when we do that work, we also try to ask not just here, come help us feed the hungry, but help us understand why they are hungry and let's look at some of the root causes. One of the root causes is the way our economy is set up. Uh, so our climate change task force has been doing a bit of work that touches that too. You think, what does climate change have to do with hunger? Well, I could spend a whole evening talking to you about those connections. I'm sure some of you could do an even better job than I could. I'm sure of that. Uh, but what our climate change task force was part of was the, energy, the Michigan Energy, Michigan Jobs uh, campaign to try to encourage stronger renewable energy standards here in Michigan. Michigan imports a lot of our energy. We import it as Mount Takamufo coal from Appalachia, or tar sands from Alberta, or Gulf oil. Well, if we make that energy here in Michigan, with Michigan wind, and yes, sometimes we even have Michigan sun, <laughs> that's energy, that's money that stays in Michigan, those are jobs that were created to stay in Michigan. So that work that our climate change task force has been doing really crosses that bridge of looking at 
the hunger, the economic side of it, as well as the environmental side of it. I mentioned the tar sands issue. We also brought a delegation to uh, a rally in Detroit area protesting the, uh, the storage of pet coke, tar sands, uh, waste products on the Detroit River. Uh, and right now, the task force is wrapping up some work around some trade agreements. The rules of the game on how energy and other things are traded around the world end up having a tremendous impact on what happens in our atmosphere and in our lives. A lot of those negotiations have been in secret. Our climate change task force has been doing work to bring them up and to make them public. With our racial and economic justice task force, a lot of the last 12 months have been spent doing work on the Understanding Race Project. Again, this is an example where much of our best work is not work we try to sit and do all, all alone by ourselves. It's work we do in part. The University of Michigan was bringing in an exhibit on uh, race, why are we so different? So we said, there are opportunities we have to partner with that, to help make that effort stronger. One of those was by getting more people involved with the Ann Arbor Slanty Reads. Uh, Ron Williams was one of the people who helped make sure that there was a, a hard-hitting book that was selected from the Ann Arbor Slanty Reads last year. The New Jim Crow by Michelle Alexander. Fantastic book. We helped make sure that more people were reading that. Pastor uh, Jeffrey Harrell, who's here, one of our board members, organized a pastor study for that book. We had congregations who were reading it, trying to help build the awareness about what's happening here in our community and around the world on issues. That was work that mostly happened within communities. We also did work to bridge those divides. This photo is from a dialogue we had at the Museum of Natural History, where we brought faith leaders together from across the country, especially in our of Salandi, uh, to, to explore these issues of race, religion, uh, religious difference, racial, Equality and to start breaking down those boundaries. This is 50 years ago that Martin Luther King said, 11 a.m. on a Sunday morning is the most segregated hour in America. That's still very true. And so, this work of bridging those differences was part of finding a way to overcome that, that difference. This was a, an event with, with faith leaders talking amongst themselves. We also had things like a, this was a dialogue we had at the Ann Arbor District Library with Jewish, Christian, Muslim, and Native American leaders from a variety of backgrounds sharing their experiences for a public audience. This education, this dialogue though, that, that has power to be transformative. But it's not enough. So out of that is, has come various initiatives to try to affect some of the policies and some of the day-to-day -day things that happen around that. We're partnering with uh, WIRAM, the Washtenaw uh, Regional Organizing Committee, as well as the Ann Arbor Human Rights Commission. We've got WIRAM and Human Rights Commission members here in the audience today to look at uh, what's called a ban the box campaign that tries to remove some of the barriers to employment for people who are returning to our community after serving up their sentences. Uh, and Mary King who was involved in the prisoner reentry project that is still fully funded and properly supported. Uh, was one of the early leaders on that effort. Um, and of course, you're here tonight to talk about restorative justice. You'll hear soon about restorative justice. Again, this is an effort where some of our best work happens in collaboration. When I heard from Kathy Wyatt from the Sheriff's Office and Belinda Doolin from the Dispute Resolution Center and some of the other people who are doing really groundbreaking work around restorative justice in our community, at, uh, the members of the Victim Offender Conferencing Project saying, how do we get this word out? How do we get volunteers in? ICPJ has been there to say, yes, we can help get the word out. We can help make this program a success. I'm not going to steal the thunder from the program tonight about what all that looks like, but it's, it's uh, I will say, though, that two years ago I sat down with uh, Linda Doolin from the Dispute Resolution Center and saying, well, you're doing great things on inter some of these tenant disputes or, or other things like that. Why isn't this happening more as an alternative to the court system? And it just in the two years since then, I've seen an amazing energy, things really turning around and happening around us. It's a very exciting time. And I'm just delighted that we've got so many people, so many leaders in our community helping make that happen. And I see they're able to play our part in that community effort.
Another piece of our, of our policy work, uh, last year the Hanover City Council, the budget that the council received, the initial proposal was calling for cuts to our human service budget. Again, as part of a collaborative community effort, we were stepping forward saying, no, let's not balance the budget on the backs of the board. We were able to get those cuts not only restored, but turned around and have an increase in affordable housing and human service funding. Now, where we're putting a lot of our attention is on the issue of transport access to transportation. Uh, this, I didn't. I was running a little bit late to get here to help set up uh, this evening, uh, partly because I I was picking up Michelle Barney, who's a Plymouth Landy, who really wanted to be here tonight. Michelle has an amazing transportation story. She lost her job in the recession, went, got retrained at uh, Washington Community College. And because of her training in the healthcare field, was off, had a, a job offer. There was just a problem, one problem. The job started at 8. She couldn't get there on the bus in time for that job to start. So they said, OK, we'll give you a later shift. And she could have gotten to that later shift. But she couldn't have gotten home. <laughs> she was ready. She, uh, I, folks, if you get a chance to meet Michelle, you will know she is a hard worker and, and a dedicated person. She was ready to take that to be Reemployed, but our failed transportation system failed her. We have an opportunity on May 6th to provide a transportation system that will work better for Michelle, will work better for employers, will work better for our environment, will work better for seniors and people with disabilities, that more buses, more places, more, more often will really help provide economic opportunity and environmental sustainability here in our community. So we're working with our faith leaders, our, our allies, to try to help educate people what does this mean? How can you get involved and make sure that people come out of vote on May 6? There's a, so many more things I could talk to you that are happening. Film showings, uh, Laurent's Peace All Stars concert, so many amazing things that have helped that have happened over the last year. Again, because of people like you. This was just the whistle stop tour where I gave a couple of highlights. I'm sure I missed some. I know I missed things. Uh, and again, the reason that I can't keep all the great things that we're doing in my head is because you are helping so many great things happen. Thank you. I do want to mention a couple of the back end things. You know, it is our annual meeting. This is the only we spent a lot of time talking about programming. I wanted just to cover a little bit about our finances and other things. We entered last year coming off several straight years of deficits. The economic recession that hit ICPJ's bottom line as well. Last year, though, we ended up, last year we did uh, the raising more money fundraising process that uh, Ron mentioned that Jane is, and Jane is now helping us lead. This was our fundraising breakfast in May of last year. Thanks to this, to some other board leadership and other people coming forward, we ended up last year with a surplus. Um, that surplus let us turn around. We had been planning last year to have staff cuts. From those cut levels, we actually had a 22 percent increase in our program staff. From that now. So again, people like you coming forward to make this job happening, whether it's rolling your sleeves and doing the work, or taking out your checkbook and helping you get it funded, made a real difference last year for ICPJ. This, I'm sure, the lines are really small and hard to read for you, but one of the I just told you about a lot of different things that are happening across a wide variety of issue areas within ICPJ. One of the things we've struggled with and we're trying to get our heads around as an organization is how do we make sure we're putting enough of our energy into, into things that we are really able to see a big bump, really able to see a lot of impact on that. Um, our current effort on that is to say within all of our program areas, there's a pool of energy and a pool of time that we can support to them, but we're going to constantly review our activities, constantly scan what's coming down the pipeline and put and identify what's peak energy on a few things at a time so we can really give those things a, a big boost. Uh, if you want to talk more about that, I'm happy to do so. For this event, this is kind of the boring back-end stuff, but I want to make sure you know about it because it's an example of how we are constantly trying to be more thoughtful, more effective, and more impactful in our community. Right. What's next? I want to give you a couple quick head, uh, heads up about some things that are coming on. Uh, for people who are new to ICPJ, or you've got somebody who wants to know a little bit more about us, 
On April 2nd, we're having an introduction event to us, just an hour long, 7 to 8 p.m. at First Presbyterian Church. Uh, you're welcome to come to that or, or bring a friend to that. Um, later on this month, we're having a film showing of Trigger, The Ripple Effects of Gun Violence. This again is a partnership event. This is a partnership with Moms Demand a Plan. That'll be at the Wesley Foundation, which is part of First, Presby First Methodist Church, 120 South State Street, uh, April 29th from 6.30 to 8.30 p.m. On May 6th, I'm talking about transit. May 6th is election day. Make sure you vote. Make sure you bring a friend to vote. Make sure you tell people to come out. This is our opportunity to really improve services throughout our community. Uh, on May 17th, we're doing a film showing right here on um, Inequality for All. Uh, Lucia Heinold has been doing amazing work trying to, she saw this film back in November or whenever it was when it was in the theaters and said, we have to show that here. We need more people to see it. And she's been um, persistent and, and on top of it to make sure we do that. And on May 17th, we'll be doing that film showing in partnership with the League of Women Voters. Um, I just got word of this as we were setting up. So um, looking ahead to November, there's an effort to try to get a raise to the minimum wage on the ballot. And Jeff Harrell, Jeff, can you raise your hand, please? Ask petitions for that if you want to help get that, if you want to put that on the ballot. Uh, you can sign Jeff's petitions. The November uh, statewide ballot. Uh, the question is what ballot? So try to get that so everybody in Michigan has a chance to decide if, if our lowest paid employees deserve it. Raise. Last thing, and then we'll turn it over to our program. This is ICPJ's 49th anniversary. We were founded in 1965. Next year is going to be a big party. <laughs> Next year is going to be a fantastic opportunity to, for, for us to reflect on not just did, what did we do over the last year, but what have we done over the last 50 years? to celebrate all the people who've done so many amazing, transformative, incredible things that have made a difference here in Washtenaw County and in some cases around the world. We've got a little bit of time to plan that party. So what I'm asking you today is to give some thought. How can we celebrate? How can we have a great, amazing 50th anniversary that doesn't just celebrate the past, but propels us into the future. What's your idea? What should we be doing? And I want you to think about that, and I want you to share that idea with me, or to share it with Jane. And then, once you've got that idea, or, you, or maybe you don't have an idea, maybe you just know this is going to be a big party and you want to be part of it, I want you to share your time as well so that we can make this a fantastic 50th anniversary year next year. That's my piece. Any quick questions before we turn it over to Ron Williams and the panel? All right, well, thank you all for the amazing things you've helped us to be doing today.